So um, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to this um, opening session uh, today. I think we are ready to start with, um, with the session of today. And it's my pleasure, it's my honor to welcome you to this opening session of IESC International Summer School on EU and the future, which is really a hard task for our panelists to uh, predict and start to imagine uh, the future of European integration and the future of Europe. So we will embark together on this journey to explore uh, the, 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 the future challenges, the future opportunities of European uh, integration. Uh, we are privileged to have a distinguished group of uh, panelists um, who, um, a, a group of uh, experts who will provide valuable insights into uh, the complex dynamics of EU policies, EU enlargement, EU integration, and um, uh, the evolving political and social, economic and security issues and landscape uh, within the European Union. Uh, throughout our discussions, uh, we will address critical issues such as um, how can uh, EU effectively balance national uh, sovereignty uh, with the imperative for deeper integration in areas such as uh, fiscal policy, uh, border security, but also other issues uh, that will enhance its global standing in the international arena. And uh, other critical issues that we will address today are uh, what are some effective uh, strategies uh, for strengthening democratic values in the wake of such geopolitical shifts but also political shifts internally considering also the rise of uh, populism in some uh, member states additionally we will examine uh, the role of uh, EU's cohesion policy uh, in supporting less developed regions and fostering overall uh, economic convergence uh, within the Union so I'll start to introduce uh, our uh, distinguished guest speakers uh, one by one and after listening to them all then we can uh, uh, start engaging in discussions, asking questions, so I encourage all the participants to uh, engage in uh, vibrant discussions because it is through this interactivity synergy that we can enhance our collective understanding to such critical issues that we will start uh, discussing uh, today. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, first guest uh, speaker. He is Dr. Ivan Baba. Uh, who is not only a research fellow here at IESC Institute, but also a distinguished professor at the National University of Public Service in Hungary. He has an extensive experience in the Hungarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, serving in various capacities from uh, 99, uh, 90s to 2014. Um, he has a profound expertise in the field of political science, but also international relations, uh, dealing with collapse of communism um, in, um, uh, and regime change in Hungary and Central Europe. What makes him a highly respected authority in this research field and in the realm of European studies? So, Dr. Baba, we are pleased to have you here, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> After such an introduction, what can I <laughs> still tell you? Uh, one thing that I would like to mention that my recent work was the editing an encyclopedia on diplomacy. And I'm very happy and proud that one of my collaborators, uh, distinguished ambassador Andre Erdős, is here with us. This uh, encyclopedia was published uh, last year in English, two years ago in Hungarian. And I guess it might be useful for everybody to read different uh, chapters on, on the diplomatic relations. I would like to pass. Well, to tomorrow we will meet. I will have a chance to, to, to elaborate on my issues. Now one uh, remark I would like to make still, that everybody mentioned his own name. My name is Ivan. It is tomorrow, the Midsummer Night Day, T tomorrow will be Ivan day, <laughs> so that will be <laughs> Okay, now um, let's introduce our uh, second guest uh, speaker. Uh, he is Mr. Shen Clurry, Chairman of Strategic uh, Concept, Managing Director of the Center of Advance of Good Governance. 
uh, founder and executive vice chair of the Future World Foundation, chairman of Atlantic Holdings, uh, LDD, and member of the advisory board here at uh, IESC. Shen Clary expertise is father demonstrated through his lectures on global uh, corporate strategy at esteemed institution, uh, institutions such as the University of the uh, Witwater Strand, Henley Management College, and the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. His insights into the conflict resolution, globalization, and development economics are also shared at various US and European universities and institutes. He has today, I think, a very provoking and interesting presentation on uh, the future of Europe, future scenarios, challenges, and perspectives. So uh, please, uh, Mr. Uh, Cleary, the floor is yours. And we are happy to have you here. That's very kind. And uh, I, this man, I may tell you, <clears throat> apart from all of his other enormous distinctions, of which Andre is deeply aware, uh, is also the provider of the best quality palinka in Kusik. I have learned more from him late in the evenings the over an extended the period. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it, it just shows the opportunities that are endemic in these summer universities. I think if I can summarize very quickly what you've just been told about me, I'm just an old guy. Uh, I've done a lot of things in the course of my life. I've spent 17 years in diplomacy. I've spent a goodly number of years teaching and writing. And along the way, we've created a few foundations and a few companies, and hopefully they have been reasonably successful as well. And that says something about the nature of the world we live in. It's complicated. As we'll hear a little later in this program, it's more than complicated, it's complex. And that has enormous implications in terms of how we address them. Much of the challenge that we face in the context of Europe has been, quite frankly, a failure to take adequate account of the complexity associated with putting together at different times, up to 28 countries, now 27 after Brexit, without understanding what the inherent implications were in respect of enhanced complexity. I'm going to touch on a few points in respect to that. We'll explore other aspects of it in the course of the next several days. But that's the frame that I want to offer you. I'm going to do this at some speed. You can all have access to all of the documentation, so don't worry too much if you didn't read or understand everything that was on the slide. <clears throat> but I want to start out with a terribly over-worded slide, and forgive me for it, but I need to be able to get a frame across to you right at the beginning. I think in all sincerity we're at the most significant historical inflection point <clears throat> since the period between 1989 and 1991. Something quite remarkable happened in that period. The war came down in Germany, and two years later, after the Warsaw Pact had been demolished, the Soviet Union exploded. Hubert Vidrin, who was the French foreign minister at the time, chose to describe the United States at that point as l'hyperpuissance, the hyperpower the entity that could determine the fate of the world and set the rules of the international order. Anyone looking at the world in 2024 knows that it's very different. The United States is most emphatically not l'hyperpuissance. There is no single entity capable of shaping the rules of the international order. And there is great skepticism in much of the world about the way in which the rules have been applied. More scaringly, perhaps, we've reached a point of the highest level of military expenditure in the last 20 years. We're actually at per capita levels of expenditure today, which are the highest number recorded since 1990. And that is a comment on the state of the world, leaving aside the challenges associated with shifting money that should be spent 
on education, health care, and the creation of economic opportunity for citizens into military and security frameworks, leaving that aside, it also reflects the degree of tension, the degree of uncertainty, the degree of fear that has taken hold across the whole of both the Eurasian and additionally the Indo-Pacific landscapes. It's an extraordinary moment. But in order to understand what challenges Europe will face now, we have to recognize that we actually, around about the time of the global financial crisis in 2007, 2008, <coughs> faced an earlier inflection point at that time. And that inflection point was the product of having made assumptions that we could integrate a global economy in a world where political accountability actually existed at national levels. And one of the results of that was that the success of the global economy, which was enormous, it took roughly two billion people out of poverty between the beginning of the 1980s and around about 2010, phenomenally successful, but one of the consequences was, was that it eviscerated national political accountability. Governments did not control, in the vast majority of cases, the welfare of their citizens any longer because it was a function of global financial flows. Highly integrated financial systems, globally integrated supply chains, a shift of manufacturing capacity from one part of the world to another, all of these things significantly undermined national political accountability. And that caused a backlash. And the backlash that we saw in respect of that, we tend to think of as being populism, nativism, anti-democratic surges. The so-called Make America Great Again, the MAGA theme of Donald Trump is perhaps the best example of that, but that occurred in the aftermath of Brexit, and it occurred in the rise of fractioning occurring within the European Union, also in Hungary but later in Poland and on the margins of the European community in Turkey. And I'm not going to talk about the populism in the Russian Federation at present, but self-evidently that has been a significant factor as well. The point is there's no point getting excited about populism if you don't understand what drove it. And what drove it was highly integrated financial capitalism which destroyed the capacity for national political accountability. Be careful what you wish for. So <clears throat> the reality of the present is we've actually got to think about how on earth we solve for these problems. We've created them. We didn't create them intentionally. We created them with the best intentions in the world, but we created them. And now we have to deal with the consequences of those, and we have to think very carefully about how we might do that. The United Nations system is trying to do that through a fairly remarkable process that began in 2019 at the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations with a report by the Secretary General called Our Common Agenda, ostensibly leading up to the summit of the future in September this year at which 193 member states of the United Nations will ostensibly adopt a pact for the future to address these sorts of challenges. But the difficulty is that this disruption that I'm describing is occurring in the absence of agreement on the rules of the rules-based order. This fractioning that I've been describing is occurring in the context of uncertainty about what rules we need to apply to put the system back together again. And the split between the West and what is slightly awkwardly called the Global South, <coughs> including Russia, China, and a variety of other countries, not all of whom are in the Southern Hemisphere. But that split is occurring largely because of a growing sense that the West is applying the rules of the rules-based international order inconsistently. And the example that is frequently applied in this regard is Russia in Ukraine and Israel in Gaza. 
It's clear not the same rules are being applied across the frame in that particular regard, and that is causing a significant amount of backlash that is being exploited by people who wish to bring about change and by persons who are simply concerned about the way in which we're running the world at the moment. But there's another problem on top of all of that, <clears throat> and that is that we are on the cusp of the largest technological revolution in human history. We're at a point at which the combination of infotech, particularly generative AI, because that's front and center in all of the debates at this point in time, but the whole of the infotech space, nanotech and biotech and neurotech, this conflation is fundamentally disrupting the basis of economic activity, the basis of social exchange, and as a consequence of that, the framework and structures of political interaction. One little parenthetical observation, recognize that between 1760 and 1860, which was the real industrial revolution, which was really only about two things, the spinning jenny and the steam engine. And that brought about a level of disruption that gave us the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, the Congress of Vienna, the revolutions of 1848, and the transformation of the global economic center of gravity, which shifted the center of gravity back from Asia, where it had been for 2,000 years, to Western Europe. <coughs> if the spinning jenny and the steam engine could do that, just think what the technological changes that we're facing today are likely to do to our established systems. So, if we take all of that together, it's going to take quite a while before the world settles down. No one in the course of the next four days, and nobody in the course of the next three years is going to tell you what the answer is. We're going to think carefully about how we can navigate through it, but the underlying reality is we haven't got any solutions at this point in time. <clears throat> but in order to come to grips with it, we have to think about three very basic questions. What is the purpose of a system of transnational governance? Everyone thinks they know what the purpose of national governance is. What is the purpose of transnational governance? Whether it's on the European level, or on the global level? What do we want to achieve through those purposes? With clarity on that, what norms, what legal rules and social norms do we need in order to achieve those particular purposes? And what new institutions <coughs> and what changes to existing institutions do we need in order to apply those norms effectively to achieve those purposes. That's the challenge. That, if you think about it, is what you're here to talk about. How do we get from here to there? And it's three things. Why are we doing it? What's the purpose? What are the norms? And what are the institutions? If anyone's got answers to those questions, you're going to be enormously in demand in the course of the next several days and probably for the rest of your lives. So we need sophisticated insight into how to communicate better with one another. Why do you think we've got so many problems within Europe? Because Budapest doesn't think that Brussels understands its challenges. States on the outside of the European Union would like to get in because they see opportunities. States that are within the European Union are at loggerheads with one another on a whole range of different issues because they can't reach agreement on the fundamentals. And that writ large is the problem of the world. So we need to get clarity around those issues. And I'm finishing with a rather depressing thought in respect of it. People have been trying to do this for roughly 4,000 years. There's no wonderful solution. If you go and take the ancient Greeks in respect of Plato's Republic and Aristotle's politics, if 
you go and take Lao Tzu and Confucius in respect of the Analects, if you go and take the Bhagavad Gita, and you go and take everything that has been written in the history of philosophy since that period of time. I tell you, we'll give you a great deal more detail on that than I would choose to do today. But if you take all of that, these are the problems we've been grappling with. We've been trying to understand what is the good that we seek in society, and how should people and institutions conduct themselves in order to achieve that good. That's the challenge. We haven't got the answers, but that's what we have to get our heads around. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the detail of any of this today, but there's where we are. That's the frightening thing. We're shifting money into defense because we're scared that we can't solve the problems and we can't reach agreement on the fundamentals. Nuclear spending is rising dramatically and the risk of nuclear inflection is higher today <coughs> than it has been at least since 1990. This is why Ukraine has happened. Look at the stretch of red which constituted the Warsaw Pact before 1989 and the shrinkage of that red and the expansion of that bluey-gray color after 1991. That's the collapse of the Warsaw Pact and the rise of NATO. NATO has expanded further as a result of Mr. Putin's foolishness. Sweden and Finland are now in, and the Finnish border on its own is 1,340 kilometers on Russia's border. If NATO is capable of projecting force effectively in order to contain Russia, Mr. Putin has made a desperately large mistake. But I'm not sure that's the world we want, is it? Do we want a war between NATO and Russia? And meanwhile, Mr. Putin is responding in a variety of different ways, completely reconfiguring his domestic military structures in order to prepare precisely for that war. So the Central Military District, the Southern Military District, the Moscow Military District, and the Leningrad Military District have all the product of reconfiguration against the prospect of an expanded war with NATO. And then, of course, Europe has its own set of challenges related to the movement of migrants and the intrinsic instability in much of the region around Europe itself. So war isn't a good thing. It's all very fine and dandy talking about expanding military expenditure to meet an increasing threat. Well, military confrontations in the Middle East, military confrontations and collapse in African states like Libya and across the Levant have not exactly been good in respect of European security. And as I said before, and I'm really not going to address this in any detail, <clears throat> but Europe has expanded since 1957 from 6 through 12 through 15, the three little southern Europeans who were brought in in order to strengthen Europe in the aftermath of the end of phalangism in Spain and consolidate Portugal within the same space. No problems up to then. We understood that widening and deepening were in tension with one another. We had to move slowly in order to make this successful. But then, boom! In 2005, we went from 15 to 25. And then to 27, and then to 28, and then back to 27. And we didn't figure out how we were going to balance widening and deepening. We didn't think carefully about what the implications of complexity within the system actually were. We passed the Maastricht rules in 1992, which effectively took <coughs> fiscal authority away from governments <coughs> and imposed it through Brussels. We then shifted a little bit further and we created a European Central Bank for the 19 countries of the Eurozone. So we took away monetary authority from national governments and we gave it to a central bank in Frankfurt. 
Now, that would be fine if all of these economies were similar. If all of these economies needed the same set of fiscal rules and the same set of monetary rules, then this might have been fine. But of course, that expansion from 15 to 25 meant that they weren't the same. They were very different. And in reality, <coughs> this concept of an optimal currency area, the chap on the right is Robert Mundell, who got a Nobel for his work on optimal currency areas. They depend on four things. There has to be high levels of labor mobility. Not so easy in Europe nowadays. There has to be capital mobility and wage, wage and price flexibility. Not really. There has to be significant risk sharing and fiscal transfer capability. And broadly speaking, the countries in an optimal currency area have to have roughly the same business cycles. How many people think that the countries seeking access to the European Union today have the same sort of business cycles as the Netherlands? So <coughs> the problem is that the approach that we've taken in respect of all of this hasn't actually met the needs. Broadly speaking, <coughs> you have to agree to work together in a union if you put one together. And in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, we had austerity in states that had overspent. And we should have had expansionist fiscal policy in states that had significant reserves. But nobody wanted to do that because they were scared. <coughs> so as a result of that, we did not get the sort of fiscal coordination that was required. And we haven't really, since 2015, managed to stabilize the situation either in the Eurozone or across the wider space. The second area where burden sharing was a major problem was in the immediate aftermath of the huge migrant surges. Not so much for Germany. Angela Merkel was more or less right. Germany could deal with a million migrants. That wasn't a particular problem. The problem was they had to cross a lot of other countries in order to get there. And the level of disruption that was caused as a consequence of all of that has left a legacy that all of you are very deeply aware of today. Constanze Stelzenmüller, <coughs> who is German of course, but has been at Brookings for some time, has a rather good way of summarizing this. The Germany, she says, that I was born into, white and Catholic or Protestant, is a memory. More than 20% of its current inhabitants came to us as migrants or are the children of migrants. My own extended Lily White and Lutheran for centuries family has acquired Swiss, American, Taiwanese, Jewish, Senegalese, and Ghanaian Slovene family members. Heck, some of us even married Catholics. Today's challenge, she says, is on an entirely different level, not just because of its size. Refugee from war zones such as Syria and Afghanistan are often severely traumatized and acquiring the skills and knowledge to fit into Germany's economy and society will be hard for many. Those who are not bona fide refugees will have to be sent back. I'm sketching all of this just to show you this. Stuff breaks at a certain point. What broke in 2008 in respect to the global system is roughly what's been breaking in Europe as a result of fairly similar circumstances. <coughs> the economy is highly integrated, the society is fractured, and the polity can't close the gap. That's the challenge. And that's what we're going to try and grapple with over the next couple of days. Thanks very much. Well, I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cleary, for your uh, very realistic and enlightening perspective. And you raise an important point when it comes to finding meaning to transnational uh, governance norms and how to make uh, international institutions fit to purpose again. And this is really important. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our next uh, speaker. Uh, he is Mr. Andrea Dus.
from the Hungarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Uh, Erdos brings with him a wealth of experience in multilateral diplomacy and international relations, having served in various capacities within the Hungarian diplomatic corps since 1965. His leadership and contribution to OSCE and the UN and other international forums have been instrumental contributions in global security and cooperation. Mr. Das, we are uh, uh, eager to hear your uh, insights into the future of Europe and the role of EU in the international arena. So please, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll try to focus more on uh, the actual challenges that we face today in the world. So if I started by saying that we live in a turbulent world. This is simply a repetition of what you have been he hearing from the start of our discussion. Turbulent, unprecedented, uh, dangerous. And if I think at my, if I think uh, to my age, I would like to say that I do not envy my children and grandchildren who will be living in a much more complicated on un, um, unexpected uh, world. But if we look at our world of today, where we live actually, we can say that in the recent decades or so, we have seen changes which actually predetermined what we see today, changes which uh, basically can be compared to a revolutions. Revolutions in information, revolution in communications. If I think about the way an embassy uh, worked 20, 30 years ago, or even earlier than that, and how they actually act today, there is no comparison. Thanks, quote unquote, uh, to these, these revolutions that fundamentally changed our everyday life. So if you look at the international situation, we have unprecedented challenges. We have to live with it. Uh, they are unprecedented challenges for the European Union we see situations happening in our, on our continent, Europe, uh, namely what is happening on the eastern side of Europe in Ukraine, where a permanent member of the Security Council, a nuclear country, nuclear power, has attacked and invaded a neighboring country. If I look back to the uh, Charter of the United Nations, it says that uh, if a member of the United Nations is is, has an, uh, uh, faces an armed attack by another country, this country has the right of legitimate defense, and it also says that this country has the, the individual and collective right of self-defense, which means that if a country is attacked, other countries, absolutely in conformity with the Charter of the United Nations, can come to the rescue of that country, militarily, economically, humanly, otherwise. This is what is happening today, not so far from our uh, borders. Uh, when I was at the UN and I happened to be in the Security Council in 92, 93, I never thought that, again, this country would face a challenge at its borders because the first one that I actually witnessed was the disintegration uh, of Yugoslavia, which is a neighboring country of Hungary. And, you know, what happens is 
totally unexpected in the world, just a couple of decades after, we have again, in a neighboring country, a dramatic situation. I would even say that it is incomparable to what we saw when this terrible disintegration uh, of the former Yugoslavia happened, because here we are talking about Russia, about a permanent member of the council, a security council, and also a nuclear state, obviously. Now, to have a clear view of what is happening today, it is of utmost importance, and here I tell you that this is the message that I'm trying to send to uh, people I talk to, young ones, basically. So, to have this clear view of what is happening today, you, uh, it is of utmost importance to uh, take a look, not only at today, when we are working, we are having good time, marrying, etc., not only to tomorrow, when we, the new generation, will be uh, decision makers, but, and this is the point I'm making, to look at the past, at yesterday, not only today, not only tomorrow, but yesterday, to learn from what happened earlier, to draw the lessons. And this is important to have a general view of what is to be done to make this world a better place. But we are obviously further away than we were, let's say, 10 years ago of this. The, as far as the Euro European Union is concerned, uh, there are value, values of the, of the European Union which are at the basis of what the EU is supposed to do. These, uh, these values are an unquestionable foundation on which the Union rests. Liberté Egalité, fraternité. All this comes from the earlier times, but they are still very, very valid. Obviously, within the, it's their meaning of the 21st century. But these values are still with us, uh, which are supposed to preserve the rule of law. So even if that happened back during the French Revolution in 1789, in 2024, we can still reflect on the importance of these goals. Now, as, you, as far as the European Union is concerned, which is one of the bases of our attention during this uh, conference, the present trends in the EU, EU, or I would even say the present trends that the EU is facing are immense. New, new challenges. Migration, you heard already about it. Environment. Economy. I would stress social media which a couple of decades ago did not exist the way it, it exists today. This is a challenge, a very serious challenge. Disinformation, demagogy, etc. So the EU has to strive to reach a common approach inside the EU and outside, you might say it's easier said than done. I do agree, but we should not forget that this common approach makes the EU stronger and a major player on the world scene. So when we see uh, these trends, these efforts towards this common approach we always remember, and these days are definitely those days that will 
remain in our memories for some time. Are we going to act together? Or there will be self-reclusive nationalism gaining the terrain. This is one of the basic points that is going on right now in the European countries. And if I think about this self-reclusive nationalism, I do remember uh, a part of my career which I will never, never forget, which actually coincided as if it were some kind of a gift of destiny to me and to my colleagues I worked with. And that was the disintegration of a neighboring state um, at the beginning of the 90s. The disintegration of Yugoslavia, which uh, showed something that I thought would never happen because as a European, I know what the 20th century meant. I know that there were two world wars. I knew about the destructions, the bar barbarism, etc. And I could never imagine that in the same century, at the end of this century, in the 90s, we will see something that will actually uh, make us remember what it means to be at war and to be blinded by rhetoric because this is what happened in the former Yugoslavia. The vulnerability of people's minds was there and you could see that. The case of Bosnia is obviously a striking example of this. I happened to be in Bosnia with the delegation of the Security Council. Uh, when we were there, we could not imagine that after our departure, something will be happening in Yugoslavia, in, in Bosnia, that will be a genocide. And here in brackets, I would tell you that uh, after the International Court of Justice declared in its decision that what happened in 95 in Bosnia is a genocide, there was a resolution tabled in the Security Council which called on the Council to uh, repeat and to uh, adapt and, and accept this resolution of the International Court of Justice. There'll be a, there was a an overwhelming support for this resolution. But there was one permanent member who vetoed this resolution. And you can guess which one is that. Now, this uh, case of Bosnia showed very, um, um, you know, strikingly that yes, with a certain rhetoric, with a certain demagogic uh, discourse, you can turn people into uh, monsters at the end of the 20th century and in Europe. Not in I Thailand, not in the Marshall Islands, but in Europe. And the Bosnians, if you take them, because this is where it happened, they were three communities, ethnically the same, language almost the same. The only thing that made a difference was their religion. And this was enough to turn them into uh, unexpected killers. So this was uh, a uh, very sour awakening that you cannot sit back, relax. You have to open your eyes. You, be, you have to be aware that what you are reading and hearing has to be checked and you should not believe it. 
as many people do. Among the challenges that I mentioned to you, migration, environment, etc., etc., there is always obviously uh, an important one which was mentioned already here, and that is the integration of new members, that is the enlargement of the European Union. Uh, the question still remains, which ones, uh, what are those criteria that are indispensable to have to um, um, adapt, adapt a country, to uh, welcome a country in the ranks of the European Union? And obviously that this process of integration, just as we knew it from our own experience, the Eastern European countries that joined the European Union, this will be unavoidably a longer process than some might expect. In this situation of today, I think it is more than expectable that this will, be an, not, this will not be an easy thing to do. I believe personally, though I certainly would like to see more than 27, and I was deadly disappointed when the Brits left the European Union. They probably must think the same thing now. But I want to have more and more countries, but I want to have countries which fulfill the cer certain criterias. I don't want to weaken the European Union by having everyone in. They have to, be res to, to respond to the sort, certain quality requirements that uh, are you know, unavoidable um, for them to uh, happen. Having said that, clearly, I would like to see one beautiful day, the whole of Southeastern Europe, the Balkans, member of the European Union but not at any price. Now, it's very hard to tell the outcome uh, of the present situation. It's, it's, it's very hard. No one can tell you exactly. But planning for the future of Europe is fundamental, especially because if you look at the various international organizations various regional groups that we have, Organization of American States, Southeastern Asian uh, Group, African Union, etc. The EU is a unique body in spite of all the problems that it has, all the critics, all the errors that can be, d can be made. This is a unique body and I would, I would say the most sophisticated institution in the world compared to all the other international organizations. And uh, clearly, uh, the situation in which we are is much more complicated than before, and we have to uh, function as a European Union in a much more difficult period of time. The, this process, of planning for the future has to take into account several dramatically important aspects. One is, goes well over the European Union. It's the survival of mankind. Uh, remembering what a former Secretary General of the United Nations said at that time, and he was Kofi Annan, uh, he called our world, our planet, a global village. Because we are roaming in the same boat, like it or not. So this survival of mankind should not be lost because that would affect everyone. The other important aspect is coming back to the European Union, preserving the union of all the Europeans. Working together with those who share the same values and ideas and even who, who, uh, with those who might have 
certain disagreements. This is natural. But we have to work together. And uh, the third aspect of our future in our world of today is to keep our doors, doors of the European Union, open to the world, maintaining a dialogue for, with everyone and maintaining cooperation with the rest of the international community. All this clearly uh, might be a general uh, assessment of where we stand, where we should go. And I know it's deadly difficult to move forward, but we should not, lost, we should not lose from sight these ultimate goals to make the world and including it within the world the European Union, a major strategic power. On this happy note, I will stop. Thank you. I thank you very much, Mr. Erdos, for providing such a detailed general overview of the current challenges that uh, we, the, the, the whole world is facing, but especially the unprecedented challenges that we are facing right now in uh, European Union. And uh, it is very important, you noted, that it is um, uh, really important to draw lessons from the past and how important it is to bring back the awareness and the discussions on uh, EU norms and values and um, how planning for the future of Europe is imperative also for the aspiring uh, countries that are really struggling to implement uh, these values and norms and implementing uh, uh, democratic systems, which is very much related to these values and norms as a foundation of the European Union. Uh, now I would like to um, um, uh, pass to the next guest speaker. Uh, Mr. Arber Vokri. Mr. Vokri serves as a deputy minister in the Ministry of Local Government Administration in Kosovo. Uh, in this capacity, he is uh, instrumental in driving initiatives that aim to bolster uh, local governance and refine public administration at the municipal level. Uh, additionally, Mr. Vokri is an assistant professor at AAB College in Pristina, where he teaches courses in the Faculty of Medical Sciences, uh, Sciences especially focusing on uh, community health care and home care uh, practices. So he has a dual contribution in the government and also in the academia. Please, Mr. Vokri, the floor is now yours, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Ms. Lule. Dear Mr. Baba, Mr. Cleary, Mr. Erdos, ladies and gentlemen, it's with great honor and enthusiasm that I stand before you here today at the 29th International Summer University here in Kozak, Hungary. As Deputy Minister of Republic of Kosovo, participating in discussion under the overarching theme, Europea, uh, Europa and the Minotaur, geopolitics between myths and reality, is not just a privilege, but also a profound opportunity to delve into the complexities that define our continent's future. And um, yeah, for me it's going to be, I have to admit, a bit challenging uh, after all the words of wisdom from distinguished uh, speakers uh, with decades of experience in international politics. The topic of our panel today, the future of Europe and EU integrations, is particularly timely and significant in an era where geopolitics often intertwine with myth and perception. It is crucial that we navigate these waters with clarity and foresight. For our country uh, that has embarked on a journey of state building, or if you will, nation building, and also European integration, the European Union represents not only a destination, but also a beacon of stability, democracy, and prosperity. Uh, of course, we are aware of uh, different dynamics, uh, sometimes 
uh, competing or even con conflicting interests between uh, individual countries within the EU. Still, you know, we, we would love to have a world with EU rather than just individual countries, uh, you know, in, in constant state of, of conflicting interests. So our aspirations are firmly rooted in the principles of EU, peace, human rights, and the rule of law. These principles are not just mere abstractions. They form the uh, foundation upon which Kosovo seeks to build a future of opportunity and inclusivity for all of its citizens. Uh, may I quote uh, uh, Mr. Chris Patton, who uh, was a distinguished uh, British and European diplomat and held a number of positions, one of them being the last governor, uh, last British governor of, of Hong Kong, uh, who had said that uh, Kosovo has uh, secured the strongest minority protection regime ever seen in Europe. And uh, we take some pride in that. However, the path towards EU integration is fraught with challenges, both internal and external. Geopolitical realities, historical legacies, and divergent national interests often shape the discourse around enlargement and integration. Yet, despite these challenges, Kosovo remains steadfast in its commitment to European values and standards. On the 16th of April of this year, uh, we passed a major decision gate on our path towards membership at the Council of Europe, uh, namely when the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe recommended that it, uh, uh, it be invited to become a member state with a very strong majority of uh, 131 votes in favor, 29 against, and 11 abstentions. Uh, this represents a point of no return for Kosovo's uh, uh, Council of Europe membership, and it is now a question of when uh, we become the 47th member state of the uh, Council of Europe. Struggling with everything at a time, uh, our country still uh, manages to reaffirm uh, the commitment to a united and prosper pro uh, prosperous state. Uh, we have made significant strides in strengthening our institutions, advancing uh, the, the rule of law, and promoting regional cooperation. Our journey towards EU integration is a testament to our unwavering determination and resilience in the face of adversity. Um, so, yeah, um, it's a loaded phrase, uh, and uh, we just can't seem to escape them, of course, uh, knowing the circumstances uh, and geopolitical challenges that we have. So I'd like just to expand a little bit on, on this part. Um, in, in many aspects, uh, the political situation in and around Kosovo mirrors that uh, that we see uh, with the ongoing conflict uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, as you know, we, we uh, Kosovo, were a political entity within the Yugoslav Federation, just like Ukraine used to be a political entity in the Soviet Union. Um, and after the breakup, um, there, was th there was a treaty, uh, a Budapest Treaty, uh, signed in, in this country uh, for nuclear disarmament uh, of uh, Ukraine. And uh, in comparison, yeah, I'm glad that in Kosovo war, neither side had uh, nuclear weapons, but also we had to sign disarmament treaty. Uh, and both, in both cases, there were guarantees uh, from uh, high powers um, uh, that the sovereignty or uh, the liberty of the citizens of, of the respective countries uh, will be preserved. Um, just like Ukraine uh, that um, inherited uh, within its borders, uh, significant portions of uh, uh, Russian population. Uh, also, in Kosovo, uh, in uh, bordering areas with Serbia, we had a significant concentration of Serbian minority. And then uh, we come to uh, the beginnings of the conflict, which uh, in Ukraine uh, is year 2014. Um, and you know the history. Uh, so it was uh, local uh, paramilitary organizations in close cooperation with uh, Russia that uh, staged uh, an uprising and declared uh, autonomy uh, of the uh, regions of uh, Crimea, Luhansk, and Donetsk. And a similar scenario uh, kind of um, 
uh, unraveled uh, in in uh, in Kosovo uh, with uh, uh, international repercussions. Uh, you may remember um, there were tensions in last uh, year, 2023, and there was also a uh, paramilitary group uh, that was trained and uh, backed with weapons and logistics by the Serbian army that entered uh, Kosovo territory and uh, yeah, just tried to uh, uh, recreate the same scenario that uh, uh, happened in Ukraine in 2014. Fortunately, this time around, it, uh, it didn't succeed. Um, but um, um, the reason why I, uh, I, I'm bringing this up is um, that in times of, of turmoil, um, we all need clarity. And uh, clarity should come from a place of sincerity. Um, smaller nations look up to bigger ones. Um, and um, you know, we are hopeful of uh, seeing in, in uh, international politics uh, that some ethics and, and some principles are preserved and that uh, you know, we have the same standards that apply for, for all countries and all nations. Uh, in the case of uh, conflict or war in Ukraine, uh, the West uh, decided to side with uh, the, the obvious, obvious victim, uh, so the country of Ukraine, and uh, we see that there's ongoing support, uh, albeit maybe uh, not sufficient, but still significant. Um, on the other side, uh, uh, speaking of the situation in my country, uh, we are still uh, under uh, sanctions or measures by the EU because uh, you know, we're just trying to preserve the uh, territorial integrity and unity of, of, uh, of the country. Uh, so, however, as we as we look towards the future, let us embrace a Europe that is inclusive, cohesive, uh, and forward-looking. A Europe where diversity is celebrated as a source of strength, where solidarity transcends borders, and where the promise of a better tomorrow is within reach for all. Um, in conclusion, I am hopeful that through dialogue, cooperation, and a shared commitment to a common European future, we can overcome the challenges ahead and put uh, the differences behind us. Um, what uh, gives me more hope um, is uh, a speech that I, I, I uh, read that was delivered uh, by a high representative of EU for foreign affairs and security policy, Mr. Joseph Borrell, with whom our government has an, I would say, interesting relationship, not always in best of terms. Um, uh, so among the things that he, he said in, in his brilliant speech was that uh, the identity of Europe uh, is not complete without having all the Balkan countries within the European Union. So uh, yeah, that, that can bolster our uh, uh, hope and commitment to a common European future so we can overcome the challenges ahead and put the differences behind us. Our country is ready to play its part in shaping a Europe that is not only prosperous and secure, but also true to its uh, founding ideals. So let us seize this moment to reaffirm our collective resolve and uh, help for in forging a path forward uh, towards a Europe that fulfills its promise for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vokri, for your informative presentation on internal developments, internal situation in Kosovo and how the war uh, resonates in the region and uh, the security and political uh, challenges um, uh, that are being reflected through uh, this war. Um, esteemed guests and participants, we had the opportunity to hear really interesting thoughts and talks from our esteemed uh, panel speakers, each of whom has provided uh, us with a unique and insightful uh, perspective on the future of Europe uh, and uh, the European integration process. Now I would like to open the floor for uh, questions and discussions. So please feel free um, to share your thoughts, your comments with us. And I think we will take the questions one by one. 
So please raise your hand. Yes, please. May I start? Yeah? Yes, 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 sure. Thank you very much. So that I pass the floor to Sean Cleary because I just wanted to hear some remarks concerning the uh, uh, state of affairs in the European Union and in the world. Tomorrow I will have the presentation at the, uh, here and I intend to elaborate a bit more on it. But now I would like to uh, raise just one issue what might be interesting. Uh, uh, what uh, Ambassador Erdős how it, it summed up the whole problem concerning the international order, the international in, uh, organizations. It was very, very instructive. Why? Because something is happening now in the world what is terribly dangerous. The rationality is step by step missing from the decision making in, in the field of international relations. And emotionality is rapidly increasing. Uh, we have here social anthropologists who know well that the human being takes his decisions in 7% based upon a rational mind and more than 90% based upon emotions. And this is very, <laughs> very, very dangerous fact. And in many cases, that's why it is very difficult to understand and to explain why things are happening and why things are not happening if something is so clear. Here are clear uh, descriptions of a structure how the European Union should work in a very logical terms, in a very logical structure. But it does not. Why? There are many descriptions how the international order should work. Uh, the, the coordinated monetary system, coordinated uh, security system, and so on. Why is it in collapse? And if now I would like to raise just one issue, what was uh, tragic and shocking, what happened in Israel in February. That was a terrorist attack from the side of Hamas. Hamas terrorists uh, killed about 1,500 Israelis, 1,500 Israelis, and took about 250 hostages. All the experts of the international order were aware of the fact then the response, the answer of Israel to this attack will be horrible. And that thousands and tens of thousands of Palestinians will die. It was for everybody who, who at least have any, any knowledge about in international relations and about the relations in the region, that this will be the, the response of, of Israel to this horrible attack. And then comes the question, who decided about the attack of Hamas on Israel? Who took this decision? Who was thinking in a way that uh, threatening or threat for Israel is a necessary element of the, uh, of the regional political system and the victims, these 50,000 of Palestinians, it is nothing else but a collateral damage. And that's what is happening now. Whole Gaza is being ruined. Tens of thousands of Palestinians are, uh, are dying. And nobody can give their proper answer what was on the basis, in the depths of this attack. What is the rational reason if, of it? This is just an example. There are many examples in world politics, not so, so brutal and so visible as this one, that several or many decisions in world politics are taken in a way which is very difficult to explain in a simple, logical way. And this is, uh, of course, valid uh, for the European Union as well, which should work on a rational basis in a very limited uh, 
uh, space could work and it does not. What is missing for a more efficient, uh, 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 more proactive, uh, integrated European politics? No, I would like to turn your attention to these questions tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now I would like to open the floor for uh, questions from the audience. So uh, if you wish to speak, please raise your hand. Mm -hmm. And we will start with Rosita right away. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you to the great speakers. I, um, I really appreciate the, the different uh, perspectives that you brought in. But uh, I have a question um, that uh, kind of is a follow-up to what was mentioned just now by uh, Mr. Biba, that, uh, you know, rationality and planned strategic, you know, intervention in international politics should be a normal kind of logical thing, but it doesn't happen. So my question is a bit more concrete, wha the first one for Professor Sean Cleary and the second for um, Mr. Uh, Erbosch. I was um, wondering, uh, Mr. Cleary, what would you say about the role of history? Because there is a recurring historical repetition of, let's say, mistakes or some kind of omissions in international politics. Uh, since at least, I mean, you mentioned uh, the, you know, the Berlin Congress, the 19th century events, but I would start later maybe with the Versailles conference when the European or the world map was retailed after World War I and then the whole formation of the League of the Nation to prevent uh, an event like World War I. But what happened is, uh, um, you know, with the attack of Germany on Upper Schlesia, you know, protecting the German minority in Poland was a pretext to do what uh, Hitler did. The same thing was happening in Yugoslavia in the 90s. Milosevic attacked with the pretext to protect the Serbian minority. Now Putin is doing the same, you know, with the attack of, you know, um, Crimea and uh, uh, Donbass, you know, protecting Russian minorities. So how do we explain this recurring minority issue that has been used con continuously as an excuse in his world history and international relations to justify or to kind of uh, undertake this kind of tragic events. And one short question for uh, you, Mr. Andre Erdo Erdos. I was wondering, you mentioned Bosnia and your role in the, I mean, your being a witness at these events at the UN. And uh, uh, I remember that at the same time, there was another tragedy going on in Rwanda. And many people have argued that Rwanda was a collateral damage of Yugoslavia because the attention was focused on Bosnia but that's why the uh, genocide in Rwanda was not prevented. And there were several anthropologists doing ethnography of the United Nations in 94, 93, 94, Lisa Malki, Michael Burnett, uh, really arguing what's been going on in relation to Rwanda and how the UN failed to prevent the genocide in Rwanda with 800,000 victims, although they knew this would happen. So somehow there is this argument that Yugoslavia and the Bosnia to caught the world attention and, you know, uh, allowed uh, the Rwanda to be, in a way, a collateral damage. So my question is, do you think that um, the lack of liability or accountability of uh, officials in the UN who have allowed this to happen, or I don't know, for officials or, you know, the Dutch compound in the Bosnian, you know, or in Srebrenica, which allowed for the massacre to happen, that this lack of accountability is something that, you know, uh, generates these events, that engenders this repetition of such events. And uh, do you think that it is possible to ask for accountability or legal kind of, you know, accountability for those who are uh, partaking in these tragic events? Thank you. Ironically, a significant part of <coughs> the answer lies in what Ivan Baba intends to speak about tomorrow. There's a rather wonderful line <coughs> that 
drawing on the platonic metaphor of the two ponies of reason and emotion pulling the human chariot. And this commentary comes out of a book by Camera Lowenstein and two others, which was the first book on neuroeconomics. It's 1993, it's quite well known. <coughs> what Colin Camera, and he was the one who wrote this particular sentence, wrote in respect of that, is that reason is a sprightly pony but emotion is a lumbering elephant. So the underlying thesis in respect of all of this, you made the point in terms of percentages, you referred to our friend, the cultural anthropologist who will undoubtedly add further insights. I know. <laughs> but the, the point is, humans are driven by three things. And all of these have a very simple neurochemical base. The first one is fear. Fight and flight is fundamental to the survival of the species, every species. And as a consequence of that, when something appears to be threatening, there is an immediate release of adrenaline and cortisol from the amygdala, sitting back here in the back of your head and the part of the old brain, it floods into the system and you react. That is balanced in a certain way by a second evolutionary drive, which we can think of as want. And want has two dimensions. One is lust, which is necessary for procreation. And the second is greed, which is why the squirrel gareth, gathers nuts before the winter. And this is driven by the dopamine system in humans. The balancing element in this problem of fear and want is social empathy. And women are better skilled in respect of social empathy for a very simple reason, because the neurochemical driver for this is oxytocin, and that is released preeminently when a mother suckles her child. Men have great difficulty, great difficulty, producing significant release of oxytocin. I'm told we can do it when we're watching a beautiful sunset. <laughs> so this tension between fear, want, and social empathy is what drives the human condition. If you tip it, towards fear, you get exactly the reactions we're all describing. It's perfectly predictable. There's nothing surprising about it. Whether you do it in respect of the question of what happened on October 7 in Israel as a result of the Hamas strike, or whether you do it within Gaza today as a consequence of Israel dropping 2,000 pound bombs on Gazans, whether you do it in the context of what occurred in Bosnia during the fracturing of, uh, you, you must know, thousands of stories by peacekeeping troops from that period, where each is describing metaphors that actually come out of 19th century recapitulations of 12th and 13th century myths out of the original. This is how humans function. When we lose the ability to be able to behave rationally, when we cease to operate in well-normatively regulated frameworks that work to the advantage of the great majority of actors, we revert to these rather primitive, basic, essential elements that drive evolution of all the species together. Therefore, and that's where I think much of what has been said to my right is so important. We have to invest in every way that we possibly can in preventing that tipping point. You mentioned Versailles. William Butler Yeats wrote The Second Coming in 1919 in the immediate aftermath. I quote it quite often. But the line that matters 
is the best lack all conviction, while the worst are fired with passionate intensity. And to draw on what Andre said, I would argue that social media provide a megaphone, an amplification, dramatically in respect of that. When you get to these strange moments, one of which we're in right now, I'm going to now draw on Gramsci's prison diaries, but when you get to these strange moments, then you get that metaphor that Gramsci got just about perfectly right. He said, the old is not yet dead, the new is not yet born, and in the awful interregnum, horrible monsters appear. Right? So that's the problem. If the normative system breaks down, if that which causes people to behave rationally with restraint in the interests of preserving the better order falls apart, we know precisely what the likely reactions are going to be. Ivan said it a few seconds ago. We all knew in the immediate aftermath, you could ask my wife, I told her on the morning after October 7 had happened when we were walking along the waterfront, I told her what was going to happen. Not because I wanted it to happen, quite the contrary. I was horrified at the prospect of what was going to happen. But the consequence was utterly predictable because it had tipped that particular scale away from calculated reasoning in terms of a fear-driven reaction. If you think back to that time, the metaphors that were being used were the Holocaust, the greatest loss of life in jury since the Holocaust. All of these metaphors were driving the way in which we people were thinking. I don't know how to avoid it. I don't think we can. All we can do institutionally is craft the strongest walls we can around allowing that tipping to take place. And going over to the other problem that was mentioned, uh, Rwanda and Yugoslavia, we should never forget that when we were talking about these things, we always talked about Yugoslavia and Rwanda. The Security Council was dealing with Rwanda as well, clearly, because of what was happening there. It is also true that from the perspective of the general international situation, the conflict in uh, former Yugoslavia had acquired different dimensions for reasons that we all understand. In Rwanda, you didn't have any kind of, uh, let's say, political oppositions uh, of countries on one side or the other, except that clearly, locally, the two tribes that lived in Rwanda were, uh, you know, in a situation of antagonism, which resulted in a genocide there. But in Yugoslavia, we should not forget that this was part of a major, um, major um, change of, uh, of the situation after several decades of the so-called Cold War, and here all these countries were more interested in seeing what the future evolution of former Yugoslavia will take that would have a more a, a, a more a, a bigger impact on the situation of the this bipolar world, which was slowly disappearing, than the situation of a, um, a genocide of Tutsis and Hutus, and which resulted in a terrible thing. Here, I also have to say that we had blue helmets both in New Rwanda and both in, in, in Bosnia. Uh, here the problem was that the uh, um, instructions that the Blue Helmets had from their center, which was New York, did not respond to the, present, the situation on the ground. Uh, the problem was that things that were decided in New York did not always take into account the actual situation on the ground. People did not know, uh, sitting on the 
17th floor of the UN building what actually is happening precisely in, in Rwanda. And here, uh, one of the major issues was that the uh, traditional, um, um, if you will, uh, behavior which was prescribed by the UN to the blue helmets that were on the, were on the ground um, made it clear that the blue helmets, which had arms, they were carrying arms, that they were using, they were allowed to use arms only in self-defense, which was a major problem, a terrible problem. So as long as this situation prevailed, and that also applies to uh, Bosnia, where um, <laughs> civilian population was attacked, uh, there, was, there were terrible uh, crimes uh, committed, but the blue helmets who were on, on, on the site, on the, on the ground there, they did not have the green light to intervene because this was not in self-defense. This was in defense of a civilian population. This is why m later on after the UN drew the conclusions of what happened, they changed this um, system of action. Today, they have to use their arms. They can use their arms not only in self-defense, in many other ways. The series of resolutions that were adopted by the Security Council, for instance, on the African situation in various countries, had nothing to do with the previous ones, where the blue helmets were actually uh, capacitated to take um, pro action, pro, uh, pro-emptive actions, uh, having nothing to do with self-defense, but having to do a lot with the protection of civilian population, cultural heritage, etc. Et so this was clearly a change uh, in the way the blue helmets were working. And one more important thing is that when we look at the United Nations uh, to see how they acted, how they anticipated, how they succeeded or failed, we should know that the UN is not a world government. The Secretary General of the United Nations cannot instruct Washington, Beijing, Moscow, whatever, to do this and that. What the UN can do depends on the political will of the member states and more importantly clear on the political will of the permanent members of the Security Council. This is why you have to have this, uh, you know, um, um, assessment of the situations knowing that for decades and decades the UN was working in a certain way where even the challenges were different than they, are, they, they became after 1990. But today, the UN has changed a lot in terms of the behavior of those who are sent on the ground to separate the belligerents and to find a peaceful, et cetera, solution to this. So again, Rwanda is not forgotten. It's very much there. Though, again, I repeat, what was happening in the heart of Europe after these two world wars was one thing, and what happened in Rwanda uh, further away was somewhat different. But in terms of human suffering, both are genocides. And when I mentioned earlier the um, resolution of the Security Council, which was rejected, uh, recognizing what happened in Bosnia as a genocide, I also had have to uh, add that just recently we had a similar situation at the United Nations in terms of calling it the genocide or not. And again, the same scenario happened. One country obstructed, vetoed, and this is why officially, if you will, in, in terms of UN language, we cannot call uh, the Bosnian situation as a genocide. But, you know, life continues, we'll see how. But I just want to tell you that it is very important to keep in mind that Europe is not the center of the world. Europe is not the only continent. There are many other continents, many problems. And Africa is and is coming more and more closely to this uh, threshold of uh, 
playing a significant, sometimes very, um, you know, uh, bad um, situation in the in the in the in the international situation. So Rwanda and also today the Sahel region is one of those regions which can impact very negatively the overall situation in the world. We must not forget. We Europeans and nobody else must not forget that we live, as I tell, I told you uh, earlier, we live in a global village. And you cannot close your eyes, close yourself in a room, close the windows, and not caring, not care about what's happening beyond the windows. The, it's, it's simply a, uh, an attitude that is very uh, uh, disparaging and very dreadful, and that are unfortunately in the UN General Assembly, some speakers who take the floor and speak in this way. They say that those who think in global terms are not patriots. I leave it up to you to decide what you think about this, but this continues to haunt us, and it will, it will be so, so even tomorrow morning. So I just want to uh, pose a question because I don't get the entire point. So there were Dutch blue helmets at the time in Srebrenica. And this massacre didn't take place in one day. It went over one week. 8,000 Muslims were slaughtered. So there is a dysfunctional communication be between blue helmets and the headwater in, in New York. I, do, I don't get the point. What was there? Authorization, authorization for the blue helmet witnessing this manslaughter because I know that the Dutch um, the government took responsibility several years later it resigned so my question is what was the role of the blue helmet there a very simple answer you're absolutely right there was a misunderstanding. This, this was a, a, a missing uh, link between the headquarters at the United Nations and what was happening on the ground, as I said. And this is why the uh, instructions that they had did not allow them to protect those people. They let them go and they saw where they were going. They were going into the hands of the enemies, the mortal enemies. So you were absolutely right. This is what I was talking about. For a long time, because clearly the challenges were different in the earlier times, the UN did not really measure uh, what kind of a reform should be um, ent introduced in the behavior of the um, blue helmets. Today, we live in a totally different uh, situation. I, I, just to give you an example, there was a special commission which was actually examining even the sexual abuses of the, of the uh, blue helmets uh, in the countries that where they were serving. And uh, uh, the decision decided that if there is a culpability, then the group of the, of the blue helmets that comes from that country, which, uh, you know, from which its citizens come, they should leave this uh, UN uh, peacekeeping operation. Many, many other things indicated that we are opening our eyes uh, on what was happening in Rwanda and, and in, uh, in, in Yugoslavia. By the way, th a famous report by uh, a former Algerian foreign minister uh, uh, who uh, reported, uh, it was a long report, on all the mistakes that were made during these two crises has penetrated the United Nations very, uh, very vi vi visibly. And uh, ever since we have seen, um, you know, attempts to ch change this situation, and in some cases uh, successfully. All these things that we're talking about uh, relate to the, uh, after the change of the century, so that the tens, the 2010, 2015. I must say that today, in 2024, the UN again is facing new challenges. 
which reflect the new situation because as I tell you, told you, the things are changing. What happened yesterday might not be the same thing today and we don't know what is going to happen tomorrow morning. So the, tr the uh, positive change that started uh, in, in New York uh, after, uh, at the United Nations after the um, lessons were drawn from Rwanda and, and uh, Yugoslavia and, and Bosnia were definitely welcome decisions. But today UN again focuses on new challenges and one of those challenges clearly is the reform of the United Nations. How we can actually reform the United Nations and this is something that I cannot give you the answer how all this will be done because the Charter of the United Nations already prescribes how these changes can ha actually happen. A majority in the, in the General Assembly is not enough. You have to have a unanimity of the, of the uh, permanent members of the United Nations. And if I go back to this genocide story, we see that there is a lack of unanimity between the permanent members. And until that continues, we will not be able to call what happened uh, in, in, in Srebrenica a genocide. So this unfortunately will continue and I cannot tell you that the positive change that started to happen will certainly continue. The only thing I can tell you is that really things depend on the political will of the major players of the international community. How will this, will, will this, this will end up at this point in time? No one knows, not even the Secretary General, not even the uh, leaders in Washington, Moscow, Beijing, etc., etc. But it doesn't mean that we should disband the United Nations. That was it would be an awfully erroneous decision. It, it still has its specificity, but we also know the limits of what the UN can do. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed all of the presentations and I was really kind of happy to see um, Yugoslavia come up in these contexts. I think, however, that is an unrealistic expectation to ask the UN or any international institution to become a moral authority. Clearly, they are not equipped. They should not be expected. Also, political leadership within those international institutions should not be expected to act as a moral authority. I mean, the failure in Srebrenica was the fact that those blue helmets didn't take it on themselves to see what was happening and intervene regardless of the orders that they got from above. What, what is it about the, about the human condition that you could stand by and watch something like that happening without taking action? So, in, uh, you know, this is a human failure. It's not a failure of the UN or, or its, its communication systems or its lack of knowledge about what was happening on the ground. It's a human moral failure that when we, in a group or as individuals, face something like that or like what is going on in Gaza today, and we do not, as individuals, take action. We cannot expect that to become part of an institutional framework to support a moral, a moral uh, a moral stance on these issues. It's up to each and, one, each and every one of us to take that moral stance. Maybe then these institutions might have some kind of impetus to change the way they operate, but to expect them to become the moral authorities I think is an absolute illusion and I think it's dangerous to, to um, put that kind of pressure and that kind of, I mean, it's taking away our own personal responsibility in those situations. Thank you for, for wonderful um, presentations and I would love to listen to you when you are reacting to each other's um, talk. And I would just to, just to add something to what Jody said. And she is right, but what I would bring up is the mediation hmm, between our institutions, be, there, be they um, national, or supranational or international, and societies. So the problem with the UN, 
that it's not what it's saying about itself. It's not the organization of United Nations. It's the organization of United Nations states. And it's a very big difference. It's, so in that, in that sense, it is not democratic. It's not expressing a very important um, aspects of our everyday social life. So from this whole discourse, between the individual responsibility, which is enormous, no, the moral um, responsibility of all of us, and the responsibility of institutions, something is missing, and I would like to raise this for the entire week discussion. This is civil society. This is the capability of, of an assembly, a free assembly of individuals, that's civil society, to, um, to give signals to, to powers, to criticize or stop um, or change certain power um, relations or games. And this happened in a big way um, in the 80s. Um, Sean and myself and many others were permanently coming back to this issue, to the comparison of not so distant past. The 80s, which ended up <laughs> for many of us, 89, in a beautiful way, which very soon turned to become um, a nightmare. That was civil society on two, minimum two different levels. Local, we had, we had in everywhere in Europe, local civil society, Solidarność, etc. We had before violent revolutions like 56 in Hungary, semi-violent at 68, so very clear signals from societies towards a big power that we do not expect what they are superimposing on us. And at the same time, there was the nuclear war threat, which, is, which we have today, which we have today. And then Europe and North America and other countries, as India as well, and Latin America. We were standing up against this common danger. And there was a, there was a fantastic possibility um, to, uh, to create a global or trans-border or cross-border civil society up to a certain degree, up to a certain time existed. We do not have today anything like that. We are mute, both as individuals. OK, we have this 40, 50 people. We discuss permanently almost the same problems, but every year it is becoming worse, more tragic and more hopeless. <coughs> and, um, and, 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 and we are mute also in, in terms of larger civil society um, movements and expectations. So my question to you, what is your personal answer. Um, well, we can sit here up on, until the end of the times and we exist um, and nothing will happen. We repeat very sophisticated criticisms of big powers, superpowers, United Nations, e EU. We can, I can add a lot more about the EU's failures. And, um, and we don't find any ways out. So my not so humble question is to you, what, do, in your view, is the way out? How to start dialogue between, for example, Kosovo society and Serbians, between um, the so-called West and, and, and Russia? Hmm? And I could go on. Yes. Let, let me have a crack at pulling these elements together so that um, the other panelists can respond more extensively. One of the things that Andre has spoken to, and Andre is speaking from the inside out, others are observing from the outside in. Right? So both of these perspectives are absolutely valid at the same time. Andre was describing to you what the limitations in Chapter 6 authorizations by the Security Council are relative to Chapter 7 authorizations and what the context at the time was in the early 90s relative to the capacity of United Nations peacekeeping forces under those circumstances. As somebody very properly said at the time, if there's no peace to keep, why do we call them peacekeepers? 
It's an interesting thought. Secondly, Joda's point is, uh, sorry, let me just add one thing on that. One of the reasons why Kofi Annan, who was a very close friend, but one of the reasons why Kofi Annan became as outspoken as he did when he became Secretary General, specifically in the context of the invasion of Iraq in 2003, was precisely because of what he experienced when he was head of peacekeeping in the 93-94 period. He was shocked to the heart. His stomach was turned in the most profound way because of his own inability to have been able to address these crises. He was the guy who theoretically had the job. For the reasons Andre has described, he wasn't in a position to be able to execute effectively within that framework, but it had an absolutely profound impact on his personal psyche. And one of the reasons why he, unlike subsequent Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon wasn't too bad, Antonio is not doing terribly well, but one of the reasons why he was more outspoken and more pushed the limits to a greater significant degree relative to the P5 members and the US in particular was precisely because of what happened. It's part, I think, again, of a human reaction to a, to a, a, a particular circumstance. But the second thing that we've got to understand, and again, it's present within the debate, Institutions are the product of the circumstances that gave rise to those institutions. The League of Nations was the circumstance of Versailles in the context of the belief system at that point in time and Woodrow Wilson's disproportionate influence on the way in which decisions were made. The United Nations and related systems were the product of 1945 the product of what had been arranged between Britain and the United States at Bretton Woods a year earlier in 44, and when it came to San Francisco, and ironically, Jan Smuts, who had written the preamble to the Charter of the League of Nations, was asked to write the preamble to the Charter of the United Nations. But the structures were balancing power between five superpowers at that point in time who became P5 members. Is that dysfunctional in 2024? Yeah, that's seriously dysfunctional in 2024 for the reasons that Andre has explained in considerable detail. Was it a natural product of 1945? Right? It, it, was, it flowed quite naturally out of that circumstance at the time. This is another problem about human behavior at scale. What do we do? we find a solution that we think is going to work in the context of the time in which we design it. And then we hang on to it, and we reinforce it, and we push it, and we keep moving forward with it all the time. Meanwhile, the world is changing around us dramatically. The system is increasingly dysfunctional in these circumstances. You know this from business. It happens in almost every company all the time. The, the system becomes dysfunctional because the world has changed and the circumstances for which that particular institutional framework was designed are no longer fit for purpose. If you don't, therefore, at certain points in time, adapt the institutions to significant social, economic, and technological change, you get revolution. It's quite simple. It happens from time to time. Right? Revolutions are simply radical means of transforming institutions when the social, economic, and technological circumstances have changed radically. We may be there. We may be very close. I don't particularly want to live through it, but as Andre said earlier, he doesn't necessarily welcome the world that his children are going to have to grapple with. One thing that is a logical continuation of what, what you said, uh, if you think about disbanding United Nations because of the many problems that were mentioned here and somewhere else. Think about the alternative. This is what I am suggesting to you. Think about the alternative. Thank you. Okay. Minister, would you? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, in this panel, I may be the only, uh, the only one who used to be a citizen of former Yugoslavia and I I may be younger, um, 
than the rest, but I still remember the events, and um, yeah, I could give my narrative to it. Um, well, Yugoslavia was a product of um, uh, dismantling of the world order after the World War I, uh, when the competing empires, uh, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian, and the Russian Empire collapsed. And then uh, it was reshaped after the World War II as one of the main contributors in the war against uh, Nazi Nazism and fascism. And um, yeah, the, the center of power was in Belgrade, which uh, is the uh, you know, largest uh, city in Serbia. And um, yeah, the Serbs had the, the upper hand in, in all the dealings in that uh, federal state. I belong to the uh, rather persecuted group, uh, ethnic group of, of uh, that former country, Albanian. Uh, albeit that we used to be the third, uh, by number, the third uh, uh, people, uh, uh, the third largest population in, in the country. Um, so uh, the that that country had a peculiar role in in the international politics uh, because it was also designed as a buffer buffer state between the two uh, competing blocs uh, after the world war ii uh, so most of the time was in good terms with with both sides and it also uh, had uh, initiated um, a third block in the making uh, the movement of uh, the non-aligned uh, nations um, and um, then, you know, Serbia as the inheritor state of, of uh, Yugoslavia uh, in diplomacy and, uh, you know, in, in the world stage had the privilege of uh, you know, playing with that image um, and largely abused by it. Uh, so, uh, speaking of what happened in, in during the dismantling of the country, namely Srebrenica, uh, or uh, overall genocide uh, in, in Bosnia and uh, at least attempted genocide in, in Kosovo. And the behavior and the stance that uh, some international diplomats uh, and heads of state took towards this, these situations, I think it comes, um, it comes from a uh, part of, of, I would say, uh, nostalgia for, for uh, the country what that was idealized by um, uh, these uh, experienced diplomats uh, that uh, was sometimes so uh, maybe exaggerated I would bring uh, to your uh, uh, remembrance a case when there was a discussion of military intervention to stop the war uh, in Bosnia and it was namely that time that uh, uh, French head of state François Mitterrand decided to make a visit, a surprise visit in Sarajevo. So the Sarajevo uh, was uh, surrounded uh, under siege throughout the war by the Serbian forces. And uh, we all remember the sufferings of the, of the civilians there. Uh, yet when the talk was to do something about it, we have somebody of you know that stature with that impact in international politics who goes there and says yeah, everything looks rather okay. Um, so uh, I still believe that the international forums and institutions um, still have difficulty in getting enough uh, loyalty from individual countries and uh, individual national interests prevail over in decision making over over uh, shared interests and and you know uh, co common values, um, and uh, as uh, as for how to initiate or how to conduct the dialogue between Kosovo and and Serbia or the Serbs, well, it's been going on you know, back and forth um, at least since 2011, and uh, we managed to have 39 dysfunctional uh, agreements, like most of them are not being uh, implemented. Um, so one way to do this could be just to engage with the local Serbs and move on until, you know, um, Serbia or, or international institutions and countries who have sway uh, 
over these institutions realize that uh, you know neutrality doesn't imply indifference so you know being neutral having a neutral stance in a dialogue shouldn't imply being indifferent to who has the moral uh, right over the other thanks just one word on Kosovo again, showing to you that sometimes reality knocks on the doors of the governments of the United Nations and the UN itself, and the UN approves something that is not necessarily in conformity with the charter of the United Nations. This was the case when, in Kosovo, after long discussions in the Security Council on the situation in Kosovo, and these discussions remained unsuccessful, and there was some kind of a genocide in Kosovo by the uh, Milosevic army, NATO, in a desperate action, decided to launch a almost 80-day bombing campaign over Kosovo and over Serbia to get Milosevic out of Kosovo and stop uh, the killings in Kosovo. I was at that time at the United Nations and I saw physically that the overwhelming majority of the United Nations were applauding what NATO was doing, even, even if the action by NATO was in contradiction with the Charter of the United Nations, which says that in case there is a, uh, a, a for forcible action, a forceful action, uh, then the Security Council must give the green light to this action, including clearly all the five permanent members. Nothing of, this, of, of that happened. Still, the bombing campaign happened. Uh, Milosevic was kicked out of Kosovo, and the UN, and we have seen several, ca several cases, similar cases already, uh, again, uh, approved something w w that ran counter the charter of the UN. So my point is that, yes, life is, is, is knocking on the doors of the UN. More and more, thing we see things that are extraordinary in a way, but what the final solution will be, what the final uh, step in this will be is, is a very uh, sensitive issue because there are certain things at the UN Charter that you will not be able to change within, without the uh, uh, agreement of the five permanent members and until that time we will continue this way even if in one beautiful day people decide that the G4 the four countries that are they, they, they are asking they, they are for a permanent membership in the Security Council, Brazil, India, Germany, and Japan. In case they are there, it's still, it's still a mystery, but if, in case they are there, it will not change the present prevailing situation. This is why I said earlier that, yes, if we try to put this aside, show, I mean, throw it out of the window, the question is what we should have in its place because the UN has a tremendously important place, not only in terms of security, but in all the aspects of human life, UN is there and working. So the alternative is a very delicate issue. Yes, please. I, I hope there is no misunderstanding. Uh, Andre, uh, no, I think nobody in, in this room, except I don't know the newcomer's opinion, believes um, that, um, uh, that a, a NATO, a UN, uh, and, 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 and the EU um, should collapse. Or, or, or it's, it's not better to have a UN and NATO and an EU with their existing mistakes, failures, and incapacities. Why? Our question, not only my question, is what is this tiny little, very, very um, delicate and for the time being 
uh, not identifiable past, the road between the present incapacity or I wouldn't say collapse, but stagnating state of affairs of these institutions, the incapacity to react in time and, and, and in new time and in an in efficient way to tragic events, and, and the revolution or the explosion um, uh, Shankly is talking about. And there must be a way. When this, this, this is under-discussed, we don't have the global to or the local or the regional fora for that, but it's our failure, my, my suggestion. We need to recreate in a new way. Yes, it's a completely different time, 2024, than it was in 2000, I mean 1979 and, not, and 80 when Solidarność was born. So we need to rethink this capacity of, of societies, civil societies, to democratize, or if this word is not correct anymore, at least make accountable their own institutions. And this is not possible without questioning them, sometimes in a more radical and new ways than it happened before. And this is what we, are, we have, we have this vacuum where we are talking, uh, good friends and colleagues talking to each other in small circles without any or without much consequences. I can really just hope that this discussion is tapped by several secret agencies and they will spread. This is what we hoped in, this, in, the, in the 80s, that they, are, they were tapping our phones and we said suggested things which, which we asked questions which made them frightened and thinking. So to, to make these institutions change, we, they need pressure and open questioning. And unfortunately, including myself, we do not know how to do it. We should figure it out. Otherwise, we are this, this downward spiral, as you all, almost all of you, suggested, is going faster and faster. And even, even now, today, nobody knows how to stop the, down, the downward spiral. So I think this is a good, good moment maybe to, to stop, I mean, if there are other, because we have the great opportunity to continue. Yes, of course, I don't want to stop anyone to ask questions, but I'm saying is that fortunately, and this is a rare occasion, that many of the panelists are going to be with us tomorrow and even after tomorrow. So whatever we cannot discuss today, we have a chance to go and continue tomorrow. Thank you very much. I just wanted to continue your thought and end it in a positive note because we spoke about the UN and we have the UN Security Council resolutions about women peace and security and youth peace and security. And these are ways that we include civil society through different channels like the emotionality of women that we had the example right now and the opinions of young people who are the builders of the next uh, world that we are going to have. So. In this case, we just need continuity of these uh, two initiatives, Youth Peace and Security and Women Peace and Security. And I think we are doing it very well. The EU at this moment is doing a lot on this. And I'll speak about this tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Nelly Kirilova, and I'm a recent doctor in international relations and security. And um, I'm a PhD fellow at the in Brussels in the European Security and Defense College. to, uh, you know, make peacekeeping missions in a way economic intervention. Bond still in Kosovo with 30,000 American soldiers doesn't consume anything local from Kosovo. Tomatoes, food, water, everything is imported through Halliburton, Root and Brown and Root. And this is something that is easily changeable. It doesn't need the Security Council mm -hmm. to make it an economic intervention for the local region. And I am from Kumanovo, from North Macedonia. So, so many of my friends, educated doctors, lawyers, worked in bone steel in the laundry room because the uh, sellers are so high. But, uh, and they told me that there's nothing 
local in, Bra in uh, Bond still. So my question to you is, do you agree with this? I mean, don't you react to this? I know you're acknowledging the partnership with it and the support by US, but this is not, uh, you know. <laughs> Well, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, well, we, I mean, no other country has any, any influence over the decisions of the uh, United States and, and its military in particular. Uh, but yeah, it would be nice if we, if, if we could sell something to them or even the neighboring countries. And just a small correction, there are way less than 30,000 soldiers. It was the, uh, the entire K4 peace, peacekeeping uh, contingent that had initially 30,000. Now there's just a couple of hundred uh, US soldiers. And uh, also allow me to, uh, since we are in this great country, also to uh, bring to your attention that there are also Hungarian soldiers in peacekeeping mission. I had uh, many close encounters with them recently, uh, dealing with the situation in the northern municipalities. And um, uh, they have also um, proven their prowess and their determination, their bravery, uh, in confronting with uh, organizers of riots who were paramilitary, and we also declare them to be terrorist uh, organizations. And in those, uh, uh, in those riots, at least three uh, Hungarian soldiers uh, have suffered serious injuries. I'm not speaking just scars, but also amputated legs. Um, so yeah, uh, not just military presence, but also uh, other international presence. If they could use some of the local resources, that would be also a contribution to uh, not just the economy, but also to building interest, uh, to, to building, um, sorry, trust between us. A final word to uh, the, re the issue that you raised, how all this will continue. The key question is the change of governmental policies. This is what could save our future generations. And let me just in response to this broader question leave you with a thought overnight. <coughs> so those of you who've got time Google what I'm about to say. Pact for the future. UN Pact for the future. This is the single issue on which there is most civil society engagement in the world today in the space that we're talking about. I don't think it's enough, and if you guys can use your own networks to make that happen, in a significant way so that the voice of civil society is amplified and so that this doesn't degenerate into a classic UN General Assembly with Secretariat support drafted document which will get passed by the General Assembly but won't actually have any impact, then you will close the circle between, I think, what we're all talking about and what Ferry has spoken to in particular and what needs to be done. We don't want a revolution, but we're getting nastily close to the point where it could happen unless there is a significant engagement by people who feel, one, that civil society is not doing what it should be doing, that we individually are not doing what we should be doing, and that we have collective capacity to be able to have an impact. Have a look at Pact for the Future. Have a look at at opportunities to engage, there are four or five, but have a look at how you can play a role in respect to that. Thank you very much. I think we reached the end of our session. Uh, we have also an online question, but uh, maybe we can take it, uh, we can postpone it for tomorrow, yeah. Yes, we are looking forward to uh, uh, tomorrow morning session, which is uh, about uh, geopolitical challenges of you. And please uh, show your face uh, during uh, session uh, tomorrow. I kindly ask you to show your face during uh, uh, tomorrow's session. 
So thank you very much. Now please uh, follow us and let us use this opportunity for uh, this uh, reception at where, yes, applause.